You're listening to the Mind Shift Podcast. Oh, thank you. My name's Aaron McManus, and I'm here with my dad, Earl McManus, and we're in New York City with a bunch of amazing, beautiful, hot, sweaty people here. And if you're my friend and you came and you are so freaked out right now, I'm, I'm freaked out too, so I'm glad we're here doing this together. Yeah, and I really appreciate it. There's several friends of ours because we live in different spaces, and so um, Aaron and I host a space called The Arena. It's an online mastermind, and it's a business mastermind. And so some of our friends from the arena are here and they said, um, you know, we're a little nervous because they're comfortable in the business space. So this is a little more spiritual, you know, church. The first part, yeah. And, 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 and then some of our friends are here that just know us and trust us and um, but, but would not normally choose to be in a space that would be highly um, focused on faith. Yeah. Yeah. And but we're, we're going to talk about something that's applicable to everyone. I hope so. I really do. I really, really do. Um, no, no. Okay. So you just wrote a book called The Seven Frequencies of Communication. I did. And it's the first, you, you've written books for 20 years now? 25. 25, yeah. 25 years. This is your 14th book. Somewhere in there. You've written for Penguin Random House. You've written for Simon Schuster. You've written for some of like the best publishing companies in the world. And your, your, your disrespectful son convinced you to start a publishing company and to do this on our own. And it's the best decision we ever made. I, I, do you yeah. feel that? Yeah, it is. What is, <laughs> what is that? What was that? Air conditioning? Wow. I thought something was trapped in there. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, I've seen that movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so it's, it's been really exciting. It's been it's been a journey. I mean, I think just having creative control and being able to to to, to flush this out together has been amazing as your publisher and um, now your new boss. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about frequencies and why like why this happened, how this happened and then how you got to this place, because I think one of the beautiful things about being your son is getting to watch you in your like genius zone. You know, I asked you to give away. Uh, I asked you to create a product that was a free 15 minute like worksheet video that we could send out and give it away for free and create like a marketing funnel. And then my, my man went away for three days, came back looking like Robin Williams and Castaway and was like, I have four hours, let's go. And I was like, that's not what we're doing today. And then the seven frequencies happened two years later, which is a really beautiful thing. So I just want to dive into it. Yeah, well, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things, maybe if you just some backdrop, I think all of us here at different levels that we're unaware of, and, and especially if you're bilingual and you were born speaking one language and then you had to learn another language, you began understanding what people were saying before you understood the language. And in fact, you had to learn a sort of a survival skill by listening to the frequencies in which people spoke. So you could know whether they were mad or happy, whether they were uh, safe or unsafe. And, and I remember even when I was very, very, very young, I would say that I could see human emotions the way people saw furniture. And, and so I always had a high awareness of human frequencies in terms of that there was more going on in the human connection and human conversation than words. And we know this in very common ways. Like anybody have a pet, like a dog? You know, if you have a cat that doesn't work, because <laughs> they don't care about you. And uh, it's a completely one-sided relationship. And, uh, but um, but with, with a dog, you, know, you think that dog understands you, but your dog does not speak English or German or Spanish or Tagalog. Your, your dog speaks frequencies. And your dog pays attention to the frequencies from which you speak to it, and it knows what you want it to do, to sit or to heal or to come or to stay. And, and then many times in, in human relationships, we have a breakdown in connection because we say one thing with our words and another thing with our frequency. And I, I've been married now for 40 plus years, and the only way you can stay married that long is to learn to listen to a person's frequency, not to their words. 
And, and in fact, the, the fight we had on the way here was I said something that for me was innocuous. And, and for Aaron, it was significant. And it was really the frequency from which I said it. The words had very little effect. The frequency had every effect. And, and so if I could look at the book and go, what I, my outcome goal is human connection. Because human beings are designed for connection. We're designed to know each other and to be known. And it's the most terrifying opportunity for a human. We all long to be known and we're all terrified of being known. And, and so the book's about human communication, but it's really about human connection. So and if we're designed to communicate with each other, why do we do it so poorly? And why do we do it in a way in which we can destroy each other so easily? That's a big question. We yeah. only have so much time. <laughs> I think a huge part of it is that while language should actually be used to, re to reveal each other, it's normally used to conceal each other. We're, we spend more of our time hiding what we really mean and what we really feel, what we really are saying through our words. And so language actually separates us more oftentimes than it connects us. And if I could go to like a, a biblical reference, a Bible reference, um, in the Bible it talks about Adam and Eve, and it says that they were naked and unashamed. And, you know, because we oftentimes are very superficial as humans, we go, you know, they're unashamed because they're naked. I don't think that's why they were unashamed. I also don't think that's what it means that they were naked. I think they were naked because there was nothing hidden. And my theory is that Adam and Eve actually didn't have language in the way we understand it. That language wasn't necessary. In a sense, they were, you know, telepathic. They could, they could hear each other's thoughts and they could feel each other's emotions, that there was nothing that separated them. And so they were naked and unashamed. I mean, you wanna know what a nightmare is? Imagine if everyone in this room could hear everything you're thinking, right? Or if someone could know everything you're feeling. One, you would, your dating relationships would never last, right? And, uh, and then your marriage certainly wouldn't last. And you would be so ashamed if someone could actually hear your every thought, your every ideation, your every emotion. But so, I, I believe in the beginning of the human story, we were, in a sense, naked and unashamed, that we could communicate openly and freely. And, but when there's shame, and when there's guilt, we end up using language to separate us, to hide ourselves rather than connect ourselves. Hmm. So what you said to me earlier, our argument was about, you said it was the way that I heard it. And I said, no, you have to just understand that sometimes you package things in a way that you didn't say the wrong thing, but you knew that what you said wasn't the right thing to say. That's very complex. <laughs> <laughs> Don't refer to the Bible, just give me a human answer. Yeah. I didn't pay attention to the power of my words and the impact they could make on you. But you know what I have learned in that terrible lesson of me being mad for six blocks was that I do that all the time. And I, we walked in the door and I was like, I'm so sorry for being so sensitive. And you're like, yeah, I have to remember you're sensitive. And I was like, still again with the frequencies. <laughs> 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 Free turn down it, turn it down. Um, so how many of you have ever felt like you, you struggle with communicating the things that are most important to you. I'm just kind of curious. You ever had those moments where you're like, something means so much to me. The things that don't matter much to me are easy to communicate. Ketchup, mustard, and pickles. It's the, the weirdest order of all time. Right, on my cheeseburger. It's so simple. It's so, so clear. So disgusting. It requires no high-level communication. Yeah, it right? does. But when I'm trying to communicate something that matters deeply to me, I oftentimes feel like words fail me. And, and that, I think, is one of the challenges. I mean, mm. well, in seven frequencies, we talk about different communication frequencies. You do. And, and, it, and it's kind of funny because our, our family has some unique frequencies. Please, tell us. Tell us how you're special. <laughs> <laughs> there are seven frequencies that we highlight. There's, you want to go through them? Let's see. Let's Test. go with no, no, give no. me all seven. You wrote it. Please, 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 please. Go, go. All right. There's motivator, 
Uh, he almost forgot. Challenger, I almost <laughs> forgot. Motivator, challenger, commander, healer, professor, seer, maven. So there's seven different frequencies. And what's interesting is in my family, um, my wife is what is called a commander frequency. So she's always very clear about what she needs me to do with my life. And, uh, and so I've had 40 years of clarity with Kim. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when you have a commander frequency, you're, you're very logistical, you're utilitarian. I just need you to do this. And you have a very clear sense of what everyone in your world should do. And, but, you know, I do believe in God. And so God must clearly felt I needed more commander frequency in my life. So he gave you my son, Aaron. And uh, who also has a commander frequency. So now I have Kim and Aaron both giving me great guidance and uh, for the clarity I need for how to live my life at 66. And uh, but then if I'm not motivated to follow that commander frequency, I have a daughter named Mariah. She, she was up here leading worship and she has what's called the challenger frequency. So Mariah is always letting me know I can be better and uh, cheering me on to elevate my game. Yes. <laughs> so I have two commanders and one challenger in my life. And I, I never lack a reason to get up and work hard and make a difference in the world. And, yeah. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. But I just tell you, you're great when you question it, <laughs> when you forget. But I, so th why the frequencies and why is that important? I know that you're inspired I by a few different things. And I want you to kind of dive into that a little bit. Yeah, I think it's important because when someone has a particular frequency and you expect them or need them to have a different one, you can really move toward misunderstanding. And, and frankly, when I understood that Kim has a, had a commander frequency, it made it so much easier for me because I realized she doesn't even know she's commanding. She thinks she's requesting. She thinks she's suggesting. She thinks she's throwing out an idea. It actually isn't a lot of times a command. It's just the way she communicates. And, and when Aaron saw that he was a commander, it was the coolest thing. He sent me a text almost the next day and said, hey, Dad, I got like five or six business ideas, and they're all going to come across as commands. But they're really all just ideas. And then when I read them, they were all commands, every one of them. <laughs> and, but it allowed me to process those commands as ideas and not feel constrained or obligated or feeling the full force because a command can, comes across like a torpedo, right? Comes across strong and powerful. That's why they're commanders. And, and, and I joke about it because, you know, um, I remember coming home from a, a trip one time after a few weeks and Kim, Kim was so tired and I was tired. I walked in and she said, take out the garbage. And it's the first thing she said to me. And then I said, I'm tired, you know, can I just sit and rest? Because I didn't handle it well. And she, and she felt so bad. And she goes, oh, of course, of course. And she was making me dinner. So it's like she's serving me and loving me. But I heard take out the garbage. Now I know take out the garbage means I've missed you. You've been gone two weeks. I love you so much, you know. And, uh, and so I just reinterpret that command and to have all the meaning that it needs. Because commanders don't feel like they should have to do the, the background work to the command. Does that make sense? And But I have a friend who is... That really creeps me out. There's something in there. There's something in there. Keep going, keep going, keep going. We'll just ignore it. But I have a friend who's a motivator, and he's, uh, he's written like 40, 50 books. His name is John Gordon. When I first met him, I went on, went on his energy podcast because he was a Jewish Buddhist energy coach. And so they asked me to go on his podcast to talk about energy. And I, I don't know. I didn't know how much I knew about energy, but I just did it. And halfway through the podcast, he says, Erwin, you're a Christian, right? And I said, well, you know, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. He goes, yeah, yeah, you're a Christian. I go, you know, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. He goes, yeah, you guys think you're the only ones going to heaven. The rest of us are going to hell, right? And I said, John, this is an energy podcast. And he goes, yeah, yeah, no, my audience wants to know. And he just wanted to throw me under the bus in the middle of a podcast, but he really did want to know. And I just said, hey, John, Jesus said he did not come to condemn the world but to bring the world life. So why would I ever want to condemn the world? And I'm just going to bring the world life. And, and he said, I like that. And three weeks later, he sends me a text saying, hey, I just want you to know I've given my life to Jesus. And as a Buddhist Jewish energy coach, and uh, he goes, I went to my Buddhist healer and said, ever since this guy, I keep seeing Jesus everywhere. And his Buddhist healer said, hmm, John, I think you're supposed to give your life to Jesus. 
And, uh, and he said, what do you mean? He goes, well, Buddhism is a path toward enlightenment, and Jesus is like cheating. He takes you instantly to enlightenment. And so this energy coach calls me up. He drives across the country in a van wrapped up that says energy. It's a, it was ugly. It was hideous. I said, you can't park this in front of my house. I have a reputation. <laughs> But he has such a powerful motivator of frequency that every time I talk to him, I feel inspired. Like he believes in me more than I believe in me. In fact, I have a hard time believing in me. I have a hard time waking up in the morning going, I can really make a difference or I can do more or I can, uh, you know, I'm supposed to, you know, make an impact. And every time I talk to John, I just feel my belief elevate. Mm. And, and it's interesting because he doesn't want to be a motivator. He goes, I want to be something deeper, something different. I go, John, you're like the greatest motivator on the planet. And most people need help believing in themselves. And, and so each frequency has an incredible power to it that I think is really significant. But there's also a great shadow to each one of them. And something that you write about in the book very briefly. It's like an, it's one line in each chapter. And then you mm -hmm. kind of have like a little mini chapter in the book. And, and, and we're kind of it's really interesting to me because I think that's the thing we talk about the most behind the scenes is like, what is, how do I stay outside of my shadow? How do I stay outside of this toxic, uh, maybe triggering space that I can communicate with others in that, in that way? Why is that important? Why do you laugh? Aaron loves the shadows. I love the, I live in the shadow, I feel like. <laughs> I, like. I, feel, I feel like we all do to some degree, right? Like our, our least healthy self. And I, and I yeah. right? And I, so no, I, it's so yeah. true. Yeah. When, when I broke down the seven frequencies, uh, we, we did um, a little test marketing thing in the arena. And I said, name me any movie or TV show that you want me to break down the seven frequencies in. We had two dominant requests, Friends and Secession. And I never watched Friends, so I didn't want to do Friends. But I was really fascinated by Secession. So I went and looked at Secession, and I started trying to identify the seven frequencies, and I didn't find a single one. And I had a panic attack. I just felt this massive anxiety going, this system doesn't work. This, this paradigm is, is faulty. And I it was about to have a nervous breakdown. And, and I had a conversation with Aaron, and I went back and looked at it. I thought, look at the shadows. And all of a sudden, I saw all seven frequencies. And I realized the entire series of secession is built on completely shadow frequencies. There isn't a healthy, positive frequency in that entire series. <laughs> and, and you know what makes me more nervous? We are learning how to communicate from television and film. And we are seeing models of success that use shadow frequencies to succeed, and so then we begin to mirror those frequencies. And it's a terrifying, destructive, cultural dynamic. And so the shadows are really, really important. We'll probably have to come back with an entire book on the shadows. Yeah. And, but to the very least is to say, all of us have a shadow, but it's not a black and white. It's not an either or. From my understanding, the shadows are a pendulum. They're a spectrum. And I would say there's your shadow frequency and there's your authentic frequency. Because when you are an authentic human being, you begin to use the frequency in a positive, powerful, beautiful way. Mm. So when you become your inauthentic self, you move from, let's say, a commander to a dictator. And some of you, you work for someone who has that frequency. And it's not that commander is bad. The problem is that so many commanders use a dictator shadow that we think commanders are unhealthy. You need a commander when you're in a, in a tsunami in the ocean and he's the only one who knows how to help you survive. You need a commander when the building's on fire and you're thinking about jumping out of the 17th story window and he's saying, no, come this way. This is the way out. You need a commander in crisis and you need one who is using their authentic frequency because it generates trust. And just like with the healer, hmm. the healer frequency, the shadow of the healer is a cipher. And one of the great challenges is when you have a person with this beautiful healer frequency that they, they just know how to create environments where vulnerability is acceptable and you can be safe and you can deal with your wounds and your brokenness and you find healing 
through their words. But when they move into the shadow, they start using that frequency not to heal you, but to heal themselves. They start using the relationship to consume rather to invest and to build into other people. And I'm going to be really straight up. A huge part of what made me study human frequencies is that I became a follower of Jesus when I was 20 years old, basically. And, and I didn't know anything about Christianity. Didn't know anything about this as a religion. I didn't know there were Christian networks and televisions, you know, stations. And, and the moment I became a person of faith and then I started stepping into Christianity, it was a real dilemma for me because the dominant frequencies I heard were shadows. And no one seemed to notice. And it was really disturbing to me. And even when I got married, I would just share honestly with my wife, if I had not already had an encounter with Jesus, I would not be a follower of this faith. Because the dominant frequencies in leadership are inauthentic, they're shadow frequencies. And they somehow move us toward them. And I just think that overwhelmingly religion carries shadow frequencies because people are so broken and so vulnerable and so receptive. And I think one of the things we have to do is restore authentic communication frequencies where we know that what's happening is actually healthy and whole. Most of my friends who don't believe in God, when they told me about their religious experiences, I would say, oh, you didn't run away from God. God was running in the same direction you were. You were running away from religion, so was he. And you didn't run further from God, you ran, you ran closer to God, you just didn't know where you were going. You can't just look back at me at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> Should we open it up to some questions, maybe? Yeah, let's do that. Do we have, or maybe, could we talk about why New York? And why we're here, why this is important? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, let's do that. We're here because this is one of the greatest cities in the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that isn't a new idea to us. When I was in my 20s, I had seven clocks on my wall, and those were the first seven cities in the world that had five million people. And it was New York, London, Paris, the Rhine re re region of Germany, uh, Buenos Aires, Shanghai, and Tokyo, Yokohama. And for 35 years, uh, in my heart and my imagination, um, I always wanted us to have an expression of mosaic in every major city in the world that was shaping the future of humanity. When I was 29, I moved to Los Angeles because I mapped out the, the direction of human history. And I determined that Los Angeles was the epicenter of the future of the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of us think that the future just happens arbitrarily. Or if you're a person of faith, you think God just makes the future happen. But the reality is that the, the future doesn't happen in an unexplainable way. The future emerges out of humans. And in the same way that bees create hives and ants create holony, ho, um, colonies, humans create futures. But we do it so intrinsically, we don't even know it's happening. Mm. But the future doesn't come at the same time. The future comes faster in certain places. It comes faster in LA. It comes faster in New York. It comes faster in Tokyo. It comes faster in Paris. It comes faster in London. It comes faster in different places in the world. And if you are serious about shaping the future of humanity for an optimal good, you have to make a commitment to be a part of those cultural epicenters. And that's why we're here. Mm. That's so good. You know, We've been on a journey together. We have. Father and son. Why are you son. here? Why am I here? Why are you here? I'm here because for some reason, I left a great, great job <laughs> and decided to work for your crazy self <laughs> and give my life to something that, that, um, that, that was uh, really, really unique. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, a love-hate relationship with the church. You know, I worked for you at Mosaic for almost a decade, being a creative director and a, a pastor and all of these things and uh, tarot, and good and bad and messy and, and fun and growing things and killing things and starting 
the, the AC is starting again. Um, and then during COVID hit and COVID hit. And then during COVID, we kind of had this freedom of figuring out what we wanted to do with the future. And we weren't really sure what, we, what was going to happen if we were ever going to come back. It felt like this was just going to go on forever. And I went to you and I said, maybe my season's done. Maybe we can start fresh and maybe we can start new things. And I, and I kind of convinced you to like talk about communication, to talk about business, to talk about leadership, and the things that I knew were on your mind and your heart, um, but that you hadn't really shared before. And so I think, you know, why for me, it's just been this crazy life that I said yes to. And the beautiful thing about being your son is that I really never know what city we're going to wake up in the week after um, or what we'll do next. Uh, but that I do know that we, we care about people we, and we care about bringing purpose into the world and bringing beautiful things and creating beautiful things. And so I don't find it, it doesn't miss, I'm not, it's not like missed on me that we're in this really weird art gallery in New York City um, talking about frequencies, talking about God, talking about the journey we've been on for the last 10, 15 years together and, and doing this thing. So the why I think is because one, I, I, I stepped into a nightclub and met, or I walked past a nightclub. The, the real thing is actually, I was in an Uber and someone brought up my ex-girlfriend and I was like, I gotta get out this Uber right now. And so I said, hey, stop. I was actually gonna make a phone call and call you. And I got out and I was walking past Meatpacking District and a guy named Matt Oliver, uh, who was the, the door guy at a nightclub called SL at the time grabbed me and called, literally called me out by name and, and said, hey, why don't you come to church? And I was like, well, no, that sounds terrible. Um, but I, I don't have any friends. I'd love to like hang out and grab lunch or something. And we ended up grabbing lunch and we just would take these long walks and he would just kind of pick my brain and really like just get down into it with me relationally. And then he finally convinced me to like go to church one time and, and it was an awful experience. I had a panic attack. I, was, I didn't know what a panic attack was until I was in a church with a bunch of people. And, and then fast forward 10 years, I, I've been on this beautiful journey of, of, of moments of spirituality and faith with God and, and moments where I came to you and said, I don't know where I, what I believe in this moment. I know I'm having a hard time. And the beauty of it has always been that you've always been this person who's let me ask questions. You always reminded me that it didn't matter where I was at in that moment, but that, that, that it was really important that I asked these questions that were on my heart and on my mind. So why New York? New York, I think, is, was the birthplace of a lot of these questions. So it's always been this, like we were, <sighs> I get emotional thinking about it. I was in the shower crying, which is so weird when there's water on you and then water coming out of you. Um, <laughs> And, and I just had this moment where I was like, it, it means more to me here because, because of the questions that became important to me in my life. And it was maybe the first place where I just started digging into my own self to go, you know, and, and something you pushed on me my whole life was you had to have a worldview. You have to have a perspective. You, you always just really encouraged me. You know, you encouraged me with my faith. You encouraged me about the writing and, and being educated. But you really, more than anything, said, if you don't believe anything with your whole heart and your mind and have a perspective that you can share with someone else, then why do you exist? And so it's the beginning for me. So if New York is important because I think there's so many new beginnings for so many people here. And that's why this little weird art gallery is important for me. And I'm so grateful for all the friends that joined. I'm grateful for all of the people that flew to London and flew to New York, and we get to do this little thing and have these conversations. That's why. I love that. Did that make any it's sense? It's so good. I yeah. appreciate it. Um, this has been a bit of a different podcast for us because we're talking about something specific. Yeah, and I, I, and I actually, this is really connected to how and why we do church. Um, you know, I, I, I've been a follower of Jesus now for 45 years, 46 years. Wow. And, um, and I still have so many friends that are atheists and agnostics and Buddhists and Hindus and, and, or, and just undefined. And what I found, especially because I spend 90% of my time in the business world, um, they are so incredibly open. Like the moment you begin to have a meaningful conversation and an authentic frequency, 
that treats people with love and respect, everything changes. And I just think that Jesus is so extraordinary and so beautiful and so compelling that he deserves to be experienced in a very profoundly human frequency. And I think that's one of the deepest things that motivates Mariah and Aaron and me and all of our team and what we do together. And we know that, you know, so one time somebody asked me, if, if Jesus is God, then why are there so many different kinds of churches? I said, why would you think different is proof of non-existence rather than proof of existence? Like, I believe in ice cream. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I believe in it more because there are more flavors that I love. If there's only vanilla, I, I don't know if I'd believe in ice cream. That's just frozen milk, right? You know, you're just pretending it's something else. I mean, look all around you. Like, is, is, is color more extraordinary because there's so many variations of color or less extraordinary? Is music more extraordinary because there's jazz and country and opera and rock? Or is it more compelling? And, and, and so even when I look at like faith, I, I don't think there should be churches that are all the same. I think God is so unique and so beautiful and so diverse that there should be a lot of different expressions of him. But I also think there are a lot of people in the world who listen at a very particular frequency. And this first came to my mind in 1992 or 93 when I started studying this whale that was isolated in the world because it's, it actually spoke at, six, at 52 hertz. And all the other whales of its kind spoke at 40 hertz or lower. And so that whale could never be heard nor did it ever hear any other whale, so it became known as the loneliest whale in the world, and they ended up doing a documentary 25 years later, 30 years later on this whale. They'd been traveling alone, and I always felt like that whale. I felt like all of my life, I functioned at 52 hertz in a world of 20 to 40 hertz, and I felt very alone in the world. And now, now I have this faith thing that makes me even feel less connected to the frequency of the people that I agree with, but I don't resonate with all the time. And so I do believe there has to be an expression of faith that is like mosaic in the world. Not for everyone, but for that person who's out there who's profoundly sincere and they're really honest in their questions, but don't have a space where they can journey with you. And I, and we, want to create that space, not for everyone, just for those 52 hertz that might need a different way of experiencing faith. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyone have some questions? Yeah, anybody have any questions? We're gonna open up for Q&A okay. just for a few minutes. Just gotta stand up and yell it out. Okay, and the rules are the questions actually have to be a question. Yeah, if they- They can't be a statement. Yeah. Okay, or a sermon, because you, know, you feel like we didn't give one. Yeah. All right. Question? Rocky. Stand up. Rocky. What's your name? Rocky. What's up, man? <laughs> Not too much. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. My question, one of the things that really compels me with what you guys do is how spontaneous you are, how all over the place are, the fact that you're in New York and you have all these things going on. And so I'm wondering, though, as I've begun a lifestyle a little similar, how do you remain effective while being so, like, spur of the moment, Doing all these cool places, doing all these amazing cool things. You're right. We have a really awesome life. I cannot believe the life I get to live. I mean, I'm a little kid from El Salvador, you know, who grew up on a small little street in downtown San Salvador. And, and I somehow um, stepped into a life that's traveled to nearly 100 countries and gotten to do so many amazing things. One of the things that you know keeps you grounded is that um, is effective. what? Effective. Like how do we how do we stay effective? How do we stay effective? Yeah. Yeah. Like how do you? Because one of the other people that I follow is Craig Rochelle. I love Craig. We're exact opposites. I yes. Love, he's so terrified by us. <laughs> yeah. So how do you do both? Like how do you not do? 
Well, one, you have to you have to look at someone like Craig Rochelle, who is like a hero, and you have to decide: Am I more like him? And if you're more like him, you should take on more of his practices and models. Or you might go, no, I'm more psychologically neurotic and maybe even psychotic like Irwin. And, uh, and I, I should actually look at this model and, and, and consider this might be a possibility. It's what fuels you, what energizes you, what wakes you up in the morning that makes you want to change the world. You know, the other day, we, I heard Craig, we spoke at the same event with a couple hundred thousand people, I guess, and, and he said that they do the same thing now that they did like 30 years ago. It's the same idea. Yeah. And, and I thought, that's so awesome for him. That would be a cause for suicide for me, okay? <laughs> and I, I'm just designed to always be asking what's unknown, what's unexplored, what's uninvented, what's uncreated, what's unimagined. And, and so you have to kind of figure out, like, what makes you live most fully alive. And there isn't a formula for that. You know, when people say, what's your daily routine? Like I said, you don't want mine. And uh, Aaron, there's no routine. I'm, I've been trying. <laughs> it's like herding cats. You know, I, I wander. I, um, you do. I, I, I walk yeah. and I dream and I listen and I see things that just drop into my mind. And I, I mean, three days of not sleeping, and I start seeing these frequencies like f visibly emerge with colors and dynamics and organization. And then after you know three or four days of cold sweats, they were all there. And, uh, but that's just the way God designed me. It's not the way God designed Craig. And what I would say is God designed you to be fully alive. And, and there's a way for you to experience that. And, and you need to be healthy. What grounds me, the reason I start with grounding is what makes me successful is that I'm grounded in people I love. Like, um, I love my wife, Kim, and I love Aaron and Mariah, and, and maybe the person I love, and, and Jake, her husband, maybe the person I love most now in the world is Juno, it's, Mariah's it's daughter. Crazy. She's, she's like first, you know? Crazy. And they're the people that matter to me in terms of who respects me. Um, they are my measure of success, that I'm there for them, that they feel I'm a good husband and father. I have never been a person that cared about fame um, or wealth or power. Um, I always tell people, those are great outcomes if they happen, but they're terrible intentions to have in your life. If you have an intention that works, then it guides you throughout your life. And that's what I would say. Just make sure you know why you're about and then everything else will work itself out. Yeah. yeah. I think Craig, Craig is a really good friend of ours. And he also loves to come to Mosaic events whenever we get to invite him. And he's someone that, the reason why I think Craig is so effective is he doesn't write us off. Like we're so different. And he just goes, I love it. You're driving me crazy, but I love it. And that's what makes Craig a genius, I think. I think a lot of people in the world write the people who are so different than them completely away and go, I'll never learn something from them because they're not the thing that I want to build. Um, Craig wears our merch more than I wear, than he wears it. Um, he sends me photos wearing our merch. All the time. <laughs> all the time. And, no, no, I'm, no, you answered. It was long. Um, the, what makes him effective is that he finds people like Craig, like he did 25 years ago and bought 3,000 copies of his book and gave it to every person that came to his conference for the first few years before anyone knew who Craig Rochelle was. I don't think Craig Rochelle knew who Craig Rochelle was. And he put a guy like that on, on a map a little bit in our subculture. And I think your ability to identify people who are different than you as, as, and their genius is what made you really effective. It's because you don't surround yourself with people who are crazy. You surround yourself with people who are commanders who tell you, when you might need to show up to a meeting on time. Well, you're always on time, but like to show you how to, how to maybe to be more structured. So I think it's that ability to uh, understand that there's the opposite side of their personality or effectiveness, and that's the thing they learn from. Um, that's what makes you effective. And I would just say, I think Craig is far more effective than me. And, uh, and I remember one time my brother called me and said, 
or when God did not call you to be original, he called you to be effective. And he was quoting Rick Warren, I think. And I got really depressed because I thought, oh, he called me to be effective. And I remember called my brother a week later and said, no, I think I figured this out. God called you to be effective. He called me to be original. And, uh, and I, I just think that I just accepted the fact that I will not be as effective as some people in the world. I'm just going to be original. And I'm really comfortable with that. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. You got to be loud and you got to stand up and you got to say your name. Well, no, just kiss it over for the people in the back. Uh, I would love, I, it was very effective to hear you speak about everyone around you's frequency. I would love to hear Aaron's take on your frequency and what his experience is and how he's grown through understanding what his frequency is now. My frequency or his frequency? It, I want to hear you, you tell a story about Erwin, his oh. frequency, and how you see him differently now that he's translated what it means. Well, That's a really good question. Thank you. You are a maven and you see the world completely different than everyone else. And so I think the, 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 jo the joy of my journey of being a part of your life is that I get to see the world through your lens. And it's the best Netflix show I've ever watched in my life. <laughs> it's like taking acid, <laughs> but with like purpose. <laughs> and, but then also watching you grow, because I think the, the, the beauty of you and the genius, I say genius because I think you are a genius. I wouldn't, I don't, I only work for geniuses in my life. And I've got to watch you see the world in a completely different way and then try to leave breadcrumbs for everybody else to find the path to see it the way you see it. And that is the beauty of you. you that's why you care about communication. You care about it. You don't just look off into the future. You turn around and say, guys, there's something out here that I can see. I hope you can see it. There's something you can taste. I hope you can taste it. There's this beautiful moment in the Cinque Terre in Italy. I was a little kid and we were all walking. There was like six or seven of us and we're on this cliff side and it's just all these rocks and cliffs and stairs and tourists. And there's this like little flower that was popping out of the side of this cliff on the, on the path. And my mom stopped the group and said, I guarantee you Erwin will see this flower and make us all come back and witness this flower growing out of the cliff. And without a doubt, a few seconds later, he goes, guys! <laughs> and he makes us come back and, and enjoy this flower. And it, that's, that's you, 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 you. But you, that's why you went through that line. That's why you're telling everybody to squeeze in. You, have, you see the flower in everybody's mind and their heart and their dreams. And you just want to share that with everybody else. And so that's, that, that's, your, that's his gift. That's his journey. Yeah. Um, anybody else have, have a question? Okay. Back, Back middle, right, glasses. Yeah, you. go. What's up? Uh, my name is Laurel. Question on building something. You guys build so, so much all the time. And when you run into problems, when you run into pickups, writer's block, creative blocks, do you find that the most effective way to get through that is all gas, no brakes, so you run through the wall, or is it built stepping away from it to figure it out, or how do you get through those hurdles? Who's judge number one? Um, I think I know what he's going to say, but I, I, I would say that I think the most beautiful things that we've built have been when we're stuck somewhere else. We don't know how to push it forward. Maybe we're a little bored. Maybe we're a little bit uninspired. So we start to create again. And we just create some, we create bad stuff. You see the good stuff. Sometimes you see the average stuff. We create a lot of bad stuff and we throw it away. You know, Luke unplugged the projector. Did you guys see it? And then he was having to like click through the windows to get the lyrics back. And I was like, no, no, go back. The lyrics were cool like that with like, you could still see Photoshop and you could still see the date and the time. That feels more like our aesthetic than this beautiful little thing. And then, we were talking, we were laughing, because we are like, no, that's us, that's more us. It's in the process behind the scenes than it is the finished product. And, and that's been a part of the journey, has been to go, his biggest thing to me is just put it out in the world. Let them decide. It's no longer for you. For you. you. You came up with the idea, it came to your mind, now release it. I have a hard time letting it go. What would you say? Yeah, if you have writer's block, or you hit a wall, 
I think the most important things, uh, two things. One is play. When something is work, you begin to jam up. When something is play, you don't even realize that there's a jam. Children don't have writer's block. Children don't have coloring block. They just color everywhere, on the furniture, on the walls. Like, you know, they have such creative freedom. And our problem is that we're, we, we're working from an end product. So to me, you get writer's block when you're editing, not creating. And you have to give yourself permission just to create without editing. And so if I have a block, I go play basketball. You see, that, 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 that's the best thing, or go play padel, or, you know, I'm an, or go play chess, or go do, or watch a, a series or something. I just allow myself to play. And the other thing is um, I make myself incessantly curious about irrelevant things. Like some of the most significant things I've discovered about community is because I take time to study things like quantum entanglement. And, and I mean, the, the, just to, for me, the dynamic of quantum entanglement, they're saying that particles are forever affected by each other when they're in proximity, even when they're separated and travel at a great distance. And I realized, oh, human beings are particles. And so that means whenever a human being passes it, uh, across your path, your particles are forever connected, even though you, you're separated through time and space, which makes sense for why someone that passed through your life when you were eight years old is still impacting you to this day. And, and you know, so, when, so I, I'll just go study, I'll study, you know, sound waves. And, and I'll just study, and my curiosity will take, I, I study insects, I know it's ridiculous, but I found an insect that's a parasite that attached itself to the head of a beetle that actually causes that beetle to run to the river and commit suicide and, and it, so that it can actually lay its eggs inside the body and give birth. I don't know why I, I mentioned that, <laughs> but, um, but I, I find myself curious and curiosity takes you through a back door to where you're trying to go without even realizing it. So play and curiosity, and you, you'll make it through. All right. Thanks. One last one, and then we're done. Are you guys good? One more? Who has the best question? Whoever, you got it right here. Right here. You had to stand up. Though. Yeah, yeah. He like asked me if he could stand. We got only get one. One question. Pick, pick the best one. Tell us your name. Tell us your name. Oh, Darren. Darren. Hi, Darren. I'm actually Mr. McManus. <laughs> Keep going. Sorry. Go ahead. In my book. Which book? Seven figures. Okay. Uh, do you ever see that there are conflicting? Do you think a person can have multiple frequencies? Absolutely. I tend to reject every view of human beings that's static. Because I, I, I believe that human beings are dynamic and ever expanding. And so when I look at the seven frequencies, I just work from the assumption that all seven frequencies exist inside of every human being, but at different scale and, and, um, and, and awakening. And so I, I, I understand every human being has a core frequency from which they speak from. And it's the frequency you're speaking from when you're not thinking about a frequency you're speaking from. It's just who you are. But the more you communicate and the more effective you become as a communicator, you end up with a frequency cluster. And so you may use two or three different frequencies. And there's some people, and if you listen to them carefully, they're able to use multiple frequencies at the same time. And those are usually the most powerful communicators in the world because something begins to happen inside of you. It's, it's like playing a jazz note, two dissonant notes that create an extraordinary effect. And if you have a person who's a commander and a healer, and those two frequencies are being used at the same time, it becomes incredibly, incredibly powerful, or, or a professor challenger, and they're using those two frequencies at the same time. And so my hope is that first you come to a point of understanding, you discover your core frequencies, but then you begin to learn what your cluster is and begin to expand those frequencies. Because if your dominant frequency is commander, and you're a parent, and you have an eight-year-old daughter, you do not need to be using that frequency as the dominant frequency when you're raising her. And are you just going to crush that little human being? And if your dominant frequency is a challenger and, and, and you may not realize that you're always wanting the best in people because you see they could do more, you see they could do more, but they may feel like you, they're never good enough for you. And so you have to learn how to mitigate the power of those frequencies and use them really wisely. And, but even beyond that, 
the power of understanding frequencies is to learn how to listen to people and, to, and so that people can be heard. Because the most powerful gift you can give a human being is to understand them. And, and so when you're listening to a person's frequency and you go, oh, okay, they're saying something in a frequency that does not work well for me, but I'm not going to be offended by the power or the effect of that frequency. And I'm going to actually pay attention to what they're really saying to me. And when I have, I have a friend who has a professor frequency, and he comes across like he's always right. He, he, I don't care. I could pick up any subject, and he has already studied it, you know, and knows facts about it. And he, and, and he has such a sense of certainty because he believes that what really creates connection is the transference of information. And, uh, and, and that's what will change the world. It will change your life. And, and so you might actually feel that person lacks empathy. And, and, and so, yes, there's a whole dynamic to this. I think, I think this is a dynamic universe that we can always be expanding. And two people might have the same frequency but not use that frequency at the same level because the level at which you move toward authenticity and empathy, and I write about this in the book, that authenticity and empathy actually scale the frequency higher and higher. And so if you don't have high authenticity, that frequency is not going to be used in a powerful way. And if you don't have deep empathy, that frequency will not be used at its optimal level. And so there's ways of increasing and growing in your ability to connect to other human beings, which I think could be a revolution of human connection and communication. Amazing. OK. <laughs> hey, guys. Thank you guys so much for tonight. I, we really appreciate you guys coming out. That was that was the last question that we're gonna we're ending this podcast. I have a question. Oh, okay. Oh, hello, curveball. If we do this again, will you guys come back and invite your friends? Okay. I love it. Okay. November thirteenth. November thirteenth. We're gonna. If you know a location, send us. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, Carlos is gonna do this part. You can do this. Yes. Don't listen to me. And uh, all right, we love you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>